Good morning, everybody. Please uh, be welcome to hearing number 18 of the 177th session of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. This uh, hearing is uh, entitled uh, Structural Racism and Police Violence in the United States. This has been requested by a number of uh, civil society organizations. I kindly request them to uh, introduce themselves when speaking. Uh, and I thank uh, civil society for requesting this meeting and their presence here. And I also thank representatives of the United States for being present also. I uh, let me begin by introducing members of the commission. Uh, in first place, I recognize the first uh, vice president, uh, Commission Antonia Orrejola. The second vice president, uh, Flavia Piovesan, who is also rapporteur uh, for the United States. Uh, Commissioner Margaret May McCauley, uh, she is rapporteur for Afro-descendants and a fight against uh, discrimination. I also recognize here the presence of a special rapporteur, uh, Soledad uh, Garcia Muñoz, and the acting executive secretary, uh, Maria Claudia Polito. My name is Joel Hernandez. I have the honor to chair the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. You know the dynamic of the hearings. We'll hear presentations from civil society representatives for 20 minutes. Then uh, the representatives of the state will also have 20 minutes. The members of the commission will make use of other 20 minutes. And then we'll go to a second round of uh, comments first by civil society and then by the representatives of the state. I uh, will divide the remaining of the time uh, in equal parts. Um, there is here this clock which be ticking um, with the time available. Please uh, excuse my interruption. I try to make it as smoothly as possible uh, three minutes before the end of the time just for you to conclude. And without any further ado, I give the floor to representatives of civil society for 20 minutes. Please, whoever wants to start. Yes, well, uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Justin Hansford. I am the executive director of the Thurgood Marshall Civil Rights Center at Howard University School of Law. And it is my, uh, um, I was gonna say my pleasure, but unfortunately it's not a pleasure. We, once again, we come to the commission with a crisis on our hands. And uh, we are going to have a number of pieces of testimony that will make clear that we intend to fight for justice using all of the mechanisms at our disposal. Uh, the, to begin will be Clinette, uh, Colette Flanagan from Mothers Against Police Brutality who will uh, start off our hearing today. Colette. Thank you, Justin. Uh, good morning. My name is Colette Flanagan. I'm the mother of Clinton Allen, who was shot and killed in 2013 by a Dallas policeman. I'm also the founder of Mothers Against Police Brutality. Uh, we thank the Inter-American Commission for Human Rights for granting our request for a hearing to address structural racism and police violence in the United States. I would also like to thank, uh, extend our thanks to the ACLU for helping us and facilitate a video and facilitating a, a video that you will see uh, of the mothers uh, shortly. I founded Mothers Against Police Brutality after my only son, Clinton Allen, was killed by a Dallas policeman. Clinton was unarmed. He was shot seven times and once in the back. What our family went through during those dark hours is what most families that have lost loved ones through police violence go through. Uh, the isolation and the debilitating grief that takes away your ability to function in a normal everyday capacity. The ability to support your family is often lost through this life changing grief. Your health deteriorates and many mothers and fathers such as myself experience PTSD, heart problems, hypertension, and many other ailments caused by this debilitating 
grief of losing your child to official police homicide. What the media and, and most of you never see or hear about is the carnage and the havoc that is left behind for surviving family members. Uh, families are utterly and devastatingly destroyed in the aftermath of these police killings. If your loved one is killed by a policeman, there is no such thing as victim compensation to help you bury your child or your loved one, nor is there any type of mental health counseling available for surviving members or uh, surviving uh, siblings in the aftermath. Uh, communities are given back broken families, uh, broken families that are already struggling in most cases because of the economic disparities that black people experience in America. Police departments are funded very well with our tax dollars. And those tax dollars that pay their salaries, afford policemen, many things that are part of the American dream. Uh, for many, such as buying and owning homes and vacations and being uh, present uh, at your son's and daughter's weddings and graduations. Some of the very things that are stripped and taken from us when our children are killed by policemen. And it is a shared sentiment from family members who have lost uh, to police violence that we send their children to college and they send our children to the morgues. Honorable commissioners, our presentation will proceed as follows. The commission will next hear testimonies from other mothers of victims of police violence by video recording. Following this, Gina Clayton Johnson, the founder and executive director of the SE Justice Group will be presenting on the Breathe Act on behalf of Movement for Black Lives. Uh, next, Carrie Kennedy, Executive Director of RFK Human Rights will speak about the importance of divestment from police institutions and reinvesting in black and brown communities. And finally, Professor Justin Hanford from Harvard Law School will present our recommendations to the commission. Thank you. And now we'll have the video. My name is Quinta Sanders. My son's name is Tory Sanders. He was murdered May 5th, 2017 in Charleston, Missouri, Mississippi County in a sheriff's department. He was murdered by the sheriffs, jailers, and also police officers of Charleston, Missouri, Mississippi County. A mother never wants to bury her child. Yes, I had to bury my son. Next month would have been his 32nd birthday. He didn't get to make it there. We paid an awful big price, not only myself, not only his siblings, he has two brothers, but also his children. We miss you, Daddy! What a big price we had to pay. Yes, their daddy won't be there to walk his girls down the aisle. Their daddy won't be there to see his sons graduate. Their daddy won't be there to take that ride with them to college. He was having a crisis. He was a medical patient, but instead of getting him help, they decided to take his life, not get him any help. We want our children to grow up with their fathers. We want our children to grow up with their mothers. No one should think they have the right to take another person's life just because you wear a badge. Thank you. Hi, my name is Beatrice Roberson. My son's name was Jamel Roberson. He was a security guard that was murdered on November the 11th, 2018 by a Midlothian police from Midlothian, Illinois. My son was a security guard. He was at work doing his job. Policeman came and my son was shot in his back four times. 
although people were screaming and saying that he was security, he is with us, he's one of us, the policeman still shot my son in his back four times. I have never received an apology from Midlothian Police Department, from Robin Police Department, from the state's attorney's office in Illinois, no one. I haven't received anything from them. It's been hard. It's a horrible almost two years. I am seeking for justice for Jamel. This is my son, Jamel Robeson. It is too hard. Stop killing our kids. Hello, my name is Denise Rankin. This is my son, Deron Gaylor, who was brutally killed by Flint Police Department. Son was in, he had a depression. He was bipolar and ADD. I was there the whole 11 and a half hours where they shot him, sniped him out. The, the SWAT team was there. They sniped him out, shot him in his head. Um, they tore down the house on his body. My son was treated like an animal once they got him to the ground. Eyewitness from a neighbor said they drug my son across the grass like a dog to put him in a body bag. My son did not deserve this. You are not the judge. You was not the judge. You didn't give him a chance to get to the point where he could get a judge or a jury to say if he was guilty or not guilty. You took that in your hands. I pray that my son gets justice because my life, my children's life, his sister's brothers, his kids' life will never be the same without him. My name is Kathy Scott Likes. I am the mother of Jarvis Likes, 35-year-old unarmed black man that was shot and killed on December 29, 2017 in Columbus, Georgia by Georgia State Trooper Officer Michael Nolan. Jarvis was on his way to work that night and en route, there was a DUI checkpoint set up and Jarvis decided to turn around and go the opposite direction in order to get to work on time. Officer Michael Nolan saw Jarvis make the turn and decided to follow him into a residential area. Officer Nolan blocked Jarvis' car in and got out of his cruiser with his gun drawn on Jarvis. But instead of Officer Nolan probably just tasing him, he decided to shoot him up high and said hello. When I asked, could I go to the hospital to identify my son, the coroner told me I couldn't go and identify him, so I never got a chance to identify my son. And the next time I did see my son was his funeral on January the 6th, 2018, in his casket. My son's life mattered. My son should not have been killed. His death could have been prevented. We will continue this fight for justice for Jarvis. Thank you all. Thank you, Colette, for those words and the video presentation. Commissioners, my name is Gina Clayton Johnson, and I am a leader of the policy table for the Movement for Black Lives and one of the architects of the BREATHE Act. On behalf of the Movement for Black Lives, I thank you for your leadership and for carving out this important space for the human rights of Black people. I have the distinct privilege of sharing with you the BREATHE Act, the largest piece of proposed federal legislation ever to be presented to members of Congress by any social movement. We see this commission's focus on the human rights abuses Black people in the U.S. have suffered as promising and exemplary, and we appreciate the holistic manner in which this issue is considered by the body. 
At the Movement for Black Lives, we too work from the understanding that violent policing in the U.S. is a symptom of the deep rot endemic in the bloated system of policing, incarceration, and surveillance that has been fueled by war on drugs policies. Our hope is that the commission will point to the BREATHE Act and explicitly endorse it and recommend its passage as we aid in monitoring and report and as well as aid in monitoring reporting on the implementation of breathe act laws on the state local and federal levels today i'll share a bit about the process that has created the breathe act the movement for black lives is a network of more than 150 black led black centered groups across the country many of our member groups have been fighting for the human rights of black people in the local communities for decades and carry the expertise of using the long histories of virtualized violence in their communities. We were founded in 2014 in the wake of the murder of Mike Brown by police in Ferguson, and almost immediately we began on a process to develop solutions that would ensure no Black life could ever be lost to police or white supremacist violence in this country again. In 2016, we published the Vision for Black Lives. You might call our Vision for Black Lives platform a kind of roadmap for safety and freedom of Black people living in the U.S. Containing hundreds of policy briefs, recommendations, and analysis, this vision came out of a year and a half long process, running community meetings, listening sessions, engaging with policy experts, universities, advocates, and attorneys. If the Vision for Black Lives is the roadmap, the BREATHE Act is the car that will get us there. Guided by this policy platform, our drafting team and team of bill architects spent this past summer crafting an omnibus federal bill and corresponding model state legislation in response to the most recent spate of black killings of Ahmaud Aubrey, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, Tony McDade, and so many others. We met with over 150 advocates from the areas of housing, indigenous rights, LGBTQIA communities, immigration, criminal justice, economic justice, gender justice, climate and environment, voting rights, and education to bring together the most current cutting edge policy solutions in one bill. We held meetings with members of Congress and worked with staffs of over 30 offices to refine the bill, and the public enthusiasm has been unprecedented. Only a week since the release of the full bill, we were already counting over 150,000 community co-sponsors and, and a slate of congressional champions. The comprehensive nature of the BREATHE Act sends a message that no small tinker will be sufficient to do battle against the 400-year-old problem of racialized, of racialized violence and white supremacy in the United States. We have submitted the full 127 page bill as well as summaries to this honorable commission. So I will simply highlight a few of its features in closing. The bill is broken up into four sections. Section one removes money from federal government programs that have funded mass incarceration and mass criminalization. Section two is all about incentivizing states and local governments to rely less heavily on inhumane, outdated, outdated policing and carceral practices through grants. Section three in, of the BREATHE Act dreams even bigger. It allocates resources to build healthy, sustainable, and equitable communities for all people through the rollout of five signature grants in the areas of education, health and family justice, environmental justice, economic justice, and housing because for too long, black communities have been denied these basic human rights. And finally, in the fourth section, the BREATHE Act is, is about accountability. That means historical accountability through reparations, not only for slavery, but for police violence, the war on drugs, border violence, and our long history of racism. Present accountability for federal officials and law enforcement who have done harm, such as through abolishing qualified immunity. And electoral accountability, by directly addressing voter suppression that has for so long denied and suppressed black votes. I thank this commission for your time and consideration of the Movement for Black Lives policy proposal, the BREATHE Act. Thank you so much. Uh, next we have uh, Carrie Kennedy from the RFK Center for, for Human Rights.
There we go. Um, good day to everybody. It's my honor to appear before you once again at the Inter-American Commission for Human Rights. I, I want to thank you for having us today and for taking the time to discuss this important issue. I especially want to thank Colette and the families that she served for that thoughtful and such a moving video, um, and Gina for her words and calls to action on behalf of the movement for Black Lives. I echo her support for the swift passage of the Breathe Act. While police brutality is endemic in the United States, the recent extrajudicial killings of Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, and countless others have caused even more of us to reflect anew on the wholly insufficient steps this government has taken to address the violence that continues to naturally flow from the current policing and criminal legal systems in the United States. Five years ago, I testified before this commission, and five years later, Black people are still being murdered at the same alarmingly high and disproportionate rates. Um, over 50 years ago, my father, Bobby Kennedy, campaigned for president on a promise to address the mindless menace of violence that plagues the institutions of this country. And 50 years later, our government has flat out failed to live up to that charge. Instead, there have been blue ribbon commissions, the proliferation of body cameras, major investments in anti-bias trainings, additional resources for so-called community policing. But the racist outpouring of violence continues unabated. In recent months, the entire world has witnessed precisely what all these investments in policing has produced in this country. As protesters took to the streets to speak their truth to power and voice their demands, local police and federal law enforcement have deployed excessive force on a daily basis to silence them. Over 10,000 people were arrested during peace protests. This not be emphasized enough. As communities cry out for safety and repair, the police have responded with more violence. This is why we must divest these old races in evidence-based human-centered services and support that actually keep communities safe. Only when our collective resources are reallocated from systems of policing and systemic oppression to communities to provide for quality health care, housing, and education will truly transform and change occur. Indeed, the Inter-American Court in the Cotton Fields case held that in the context of structural discrimination, reparations must be designed to change the situation so that their effect is not only of restitution but also of rectification. In this regard, re-establishment of the same context, structural context of violence and discrimination is not acceptable. Reform and reimagining of policing are not enough. What we need are reparations and reparations will require the divestment and dismantling of oppressions, oppressive systems of policing, mass incarceration, and death. It is time for the United States of America to own up to its legal and moral responsibilities to the Black community, to all of our communities, to live up to its obligations set forth in the international human rights law to meaningfully address our long sordid history of racism by divesting from policely, policing as we know it and reinvesting in our communities long overdue for justice and healing. I thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you very much. I thank all participants for their presentations. Now let's turn over to uh, representatives of the state uh, you will have uh, 20 minutes, same time as utilized by civil society. You have the floor, please. Uh, 
Thank you um, very much. Uh, distinguished commissioners, secretary, colleagues, representatives of, of civil society. Uh, my name is Brad Fred and, and I am the deputy chief of mission, of the US mission to the Organization of American States. I'm joined here by Andrew Stevenson from our, <clears throat> from our mission to the OAS and Thomas Weatherall in the State Department's Office of the Legal Advisor. I want to start out uh, by extending my very sincere condolences to Ms. Flanagan and the other mothers who lost their children. I'm also a father, and I can only imagine what it's like to go through what you have experienced. I'm deeply sorry for your losses. Today's hearing raises an important issue that continues to be the subject of significant national discourse in the United States today. Allegations of racial discrimination and of unjustifiable police violence. I wanna clarify that in the presentation we just heard there was a discussion of a number of, of tragic situations, specific situations. Today we're here to, as part of a thematic hearing under Article 66 of the Commission's Rules of Procedure and not a petition-based hearing under Article 64 on any particular case or situation. That said, I, again, I would like to thank the mothers for their compelling presentation. It is impossible to ignore their loss. We will first discuss some of our policies more generally with the understanding that some of these issues, no doubt, touch on specific events and are relevant more generally to the issue of racial discrimination and police violence in the United States. With this in mind, let me begin by recalling that the Attorney General has stated in the case, uh, the killing of Mr. George Floyd, the outrage about what happened to Mr. Floyd in Minneapolis is real and legitimate. Accountability for his death must be addressed and is being addressed through the regular process of our criminal justice system, both at the state and the federal level. Justice will be served. As the Attorney General noted, Mr. Floyd's death and others like it have deeply jarred the United States and forced Americans to reflect on longstanding issues regarding the relationship between law enforcement and members of the African American community in the United States. When I was a child 50 years ago, the laws and institutions in the United States were explicitly discriminatory. It was not until the 1960s that the civil rights movement finally succeeded in tearing down the Jim Crow edifice. Laws in the United States finally came to formally embody the guarantee of equal protection. Since then, the work of securing civil rights has rightly focused on reforming our institutions to ensure that they better conform to our laws and aspirations. This is still very much a work in progress. As the Attorney General has also observed, the work of securing civil rights for every American has been increasingly successful in the past 50 years. Today, law enforcement agencies are far more diverse than they were in the past. And there are more black police chiefs, and more black officers in the ranks. Although the death of Mr. Floyd and others at the hands of police was a shocking event. Such events are unfortunately, pardon me, are fortunately quite rare statistically. Now, statistics don't assuage the loss that we've just heard. Um, but I would, I would just say that uh, the two independent databases indicate that there have been between six and 12 deaths due to police use of physical restraint in 2020. Some of the most high pro profile deaths, of course, are by police shooting. 
there have been eight such shootings in, in 2020, according, <clears throat> pardon me, according to a Washington Post database. There were 22 such shootings in 2018 and 30, 13, pardon me, 13 in 2019. It is permissible in the United States, as in other countries, for a law enforcement officer to use, to use force to take an arrestee into custody, so long as that force is reasonable. And that's the issue here today. Where there are credible allegations that any law enforcement officer willfully used unreasonable force, the Department of Justice investigates and determines whether prosecution is appropriate. As the Attorney General has emphasized, every instance of excessive force is unacceptable and must be addressed. However, the United States rejects the notion that law enforcement in our nation is systematically or structurally racist. Every day in the United States, tens of thousands of police officers respect, protect, and uphold the rule of law and the civil rights of individuals and communities across the country while carrying out the difficult and dangerous work of keeping our communities safe. That's not to, not to deny that more work must be done to ensure fairness to all citizens, particularly members of the African-American community, for whom it is understandable given our nation's history and recent events that there is great ambivalence and mistrust of the police. In recognition of this fact, on June 16th of this year, President Trump signed an executive order on safe policing for safe communities to develop and, and incentivize critical police reforms. The order directs the Attorney General to create a credentialing process on which police departments eligibility for federal grants will depend. Credentialing will depend on having police and, and training regarding use of force and de-escalation techniques performance management tools such as early warning systems that help to identify officers who may require intervention and best practices regarding community engagement. The order also directs the Attorney General to create an information sharing database to track information related to the use of excessive force, including such information as termination or decertification of law enforcement officers, criminal convictions of law enforcement officers, and instances in which an officer under investigation refused to, <clears throat> excuse me, an instance in which an officer under investigation related to the use of force resigns or retires. The Attorney General also directed to consult with the Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services to develop strategies for law enforcement encounters with persons who suffer from mental health issues, including strategies to incorporate social workers or mental health professionals, professionals when responding to such situations. I'll pass the, the floor now to my colleague, Thomas Weatherall. Thank you, Dean Fredden. Mr. President and commissioners, um, let me just begin by recognizing and thanking civil society for their powerful presentation this morning. Where there is misconduct by police officers or law enforcement agencies in the United States, state and federal law provide effective remedies. On the federal level, the Department of Justice may investigate state and local law enforcement agencies pursuant to the Violent Crime Control and Law Enforcement Act of 1994. That's 42 USC section 14141, recodified at 34 USC section 12601. This authority allows DOJ to review the practices of law enforcement agencies that may be violating people's federal rights and to bring civil actions to remedy possible violations. If a law enforcement agency receives federal funding, DOJ can also use the anti-discrimination provisions of the Omnibus Crime Control and Safe Streets Act of 1968 and Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 which collectively forbid discrimination on the basis of race, color, sex, national origin, or religion by agencies receiving federal funds. DOJ may act if it finds a pattern or practice by law enforcement agencies that systematically violate people's rights. 
the Civil Rights Division of DOJ has investigated dozens of law enforcement agencies nationwide. In DOJ's investigations, attorneys and investigators typically meet with law enforcement officers and other members of the local community. DOJ will also hire police practice experts to help review incidents, documents, and agency policies and practices. These experts also help DOJ develop remedies and assess whether corrective steps have fixed the violations of law. The problems addressed in DOJ's cases include use of excessive force, unlawful stops, searches or arrests, and discriminatory policing. DOJ's settlements and court orders frequently require increased transparency and data collection, strengthening community police partnerships, steps to prevent discriminatory policing, independent oversight, improved investigation and review of uses of force, and more effective training and supervision of officers. As of January 2020, DOJ has opened 70 civil investigations since 1994 into police departments that might be engaging in a pattern or practice of conduct that deprives persons of their rights, such as use of excessive force, improper searches, or improper stopping of persons for questioning. DOJ also vigorously investigates and where the evidence permits, prosecutes allegations of constitutional violations by persons acting under color of law, including alleged uses of excessive force by police officers, sheriff's deputies, and other law enforcement officers. From FY 2016 through FY 2019, DOJ charged 250 defendants, including law enforcement officers, with either willfully violating the constitutional rights of others while acting under the color of law or with related offenses, such as conspiracy or obstruction. In the same time period, the department obtained convictions of 172 defendants for color of law and related offenses. In FY 2019 alone, DOJ charged 83 defendants with color of law or related offenses, obtaining convictions by trial or plea of 46 defendants. In 2019 and 2020, DOJ successfully prosecuted correctional officers for using excessive force on arrestees, pretrial detainees, or on inmates, for sexually assaulting prisoners in their custody, and for falsifying reports or otherwise obstructing justice. In that time period, convictions were obtained in Massachusetts, Missouri, Louisiana, Tennessee, Virginia, Texas, Alabama, and Kentucky. Individuals alleging police misconduct may bring civil actions under the Federal Civil Rights Statute at 14 U.S.C. Section 1983 directly against state or local officials for money damages or injunctive relief. They may also file lawsuits against federal officials directly for damages under provisions of the U.S. Constitution for certain constitutional torts. The United States is dedicated to eliminating racial discrimination in policing. To this end, DOJ has issued guidance stating unequivocally that racial profiling is wrong and has prohibited racial profiling in federal law enforcement practices, in many cases imposing more restrictions on the consideration of race and ethnicity than the Constitution requires, and many states have done the same. And with that, let me now pass the floor to my colleague, Mr. Stevenson. Thank you very much, Tom. Uh, let me pick up on uh, what Tom has said by saying that the Attorney General has said, quote, the most basic responsibility of government is to ensure the rule of law so that people can live their lives safely and without fear, unquote. Unfortunately, proposals such as transformative divestment or defunding the police are counterproductive. Implementing these proposals would harm police, community relations, and more importantly, make communities less safe. In addition, many members of communities that would be most affected by these proposals strongly oppose them. In Minneapolis, Minnesota, for example, where the city council voted in June to begin the process of dismantling the city's police department in favor of a Department of Community Safety and Violence Prevention, 
a coalition of black and white community leaders have sued the city, alleging that the move would lead to both inadequate police staffing and insufficient protection from crime. Two members of the coalition, Sandra and Don Samuels, have noted that, quote, in the months since George Floyd's murder, we have seen an explosion in crime and homicides in their community, unquote. They write that while they support police reform, we will not sacrifice the community, the safety of our community, in the pursuit of the city council's lofty goals with no plan to back them up. A recent poll of Minneapolis residents found that 50% of black residents opposed reduction to the size of the city police force. Surveyed residents overall tended to believe that significant reductions in police staffing would have a negative impact on police, uh, public safety. As another example, in New York City, the city council recently voted to shift nearly one billion from the city's police budget. However, a number of city council members opposed the move, arguing that funding for the police department should not be cut at the same time that crime in the city is increasing. One black city council member, I. Danik Miller, recently wrote, quote, while it might be easy for some legislators to demand defunding of the New York City Police Department categorically, it is a much more real and nuanced conversation for communities like ours that have legitimate public safety concerns and rely on a working relationship, partnership to combat gun violence and other quality of life issues, unquote. Another Black City Council member, Vanessa Gibson, has opposed a move to make additional cuts to New York City Police Department funding, stating that her constituents, quote, want to see cops in the community. They don't want to see excessive force, but they want to be safe as they go to the store, unquote. This is also consistent with the results of a recent Gallup poll, which found that 61% of Black Americans want the police presence in their communities to remain the same. Mr. President, uh, the United States is committed to ensuring that all levels of the state and federal justice systems operate fairly and effectively for all, irrespective of race, and doing what works to keep our communities safe. The United States will continue working to that end to meet these vital responsibilities. We would like to conclude by once again thanking the commissioners for bringing us together today to engage on this difficult, difficult issue that continues to be a subject of debate uh, in the United States. Let me close uh, by referencing that President Lincoln said about the Declaration of Independence, that the documents gave liberty not, not alone to the people of this country, but hope to the world for all future time. It was that which gave promise that in due time, the weights would be lifted from the shoulders of all men and that all should have equal chance. To this end, we recognize more work must be done to ensure fairness to all citizens, particularly members of the African-American community, for whom it is understandable given our nation's history and recent events that there is uh, ambivalence and often trust of the police. We remain committed to ensuring that all levels of the state and justice systems operate fairly and effectively. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I think the U.S. delegation now it's the time for interventions by members of the commission, and I want to give the floor to uh, Commissioner Flavia Piovesan, the country rapporteur, in the very first place. Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. President. I would start expressing my gratitude to civil society to making possible this moment, which is so suffering and so hard and so necessary on focusing on structural racism and police violence in the states, in the United States. So I'd like to, to express my greetings to civil society, to state representatives, to express also, I'd like to express my deep solidarity and empathy to the mothers against police brutality, especially to Colette Flanagan, Quinta Sanders, Beatrice Hoberson, Denise Hanking, and Katie for sharing with us uh, the deep suffering, the hurting suffering, and especially for the capacity of converting this suffering into a struggle for justice and rights. 
So thank you so much. I, when I was hearing uh, those, those voices, I was asking myself, why, how, what for facing police brutality, impunity, and racial injustice? Uh, we can see a common pattern on those voices. And the common pattern reveals a disproportional impact of the police violence considering African descendant, black people. Violence has a face, so we are facing here systemic, structural, and institutional racism. Having said that, I'd like to raise three questions. The first, it was very touching to hear from Beatrice Hoberson, who lost her son, Jamil, who was shot in the back four times. And she said, no, I received no apologies. I, re I haven't received anything, so I'm seeking for justice. So my first question has to do with reparations. So what measures the state is taking to provide comprehensive reparations for uh, the racial police violence against African-American communities? I'd like as well to emphasize the state duty to investigate, to process, to punish, and to repair. So uh, those are such dramatic cases, I think, um, is an acceptable impunity, is an acceptable the silence and indifer indifference. My second question has to do with an structural question, let's see because as we can dimension this problem as an structural problem, we can see an structural pattern of human rights violations. So this demands structural response in terms of providing preventive measures and change, deep change and structural reform to erode this police brutality, the pattern of extrajudicial execution. Uh, so in this way, then, yes, incorporating rule of law in the security system. So here, I'm concerned with the lack of transparency. I'm concerned with the lack of accountability, independent investigations. I'd like to know more about police training on the matters of racial equality, uh, equality and non-discrimination, human rights standards. I heard from the civil society a proposal about the, um, abolishing immunity, uh, as well uh, the necessity, I see the need to adopt a protocol for the use of force uh, in observance of legality, necessity, and proportionality. So my second question is, what steps, what the measure has the U.S. taken to reform the police, uh, structural reform, and especially the use of force, taking into consideration international human rights law? And my third and final question has to do with right to protest, right to demonstrate. I heard that more than 10,000 people were arrested, were victims uh, because of the excessive use of force by the police. So uh, the commission last September 2019 adopted a report on protest and human, protest and human rights, emphasizing state legal obligations to guarantee, protect, and facilitate public protests and demonstrations. And also highlighting that the restrictions imposed on the exercise of this right must remain an exception uh, and in service to a leg legitimate interest. So, and we also condemn the lateral force, there's no place, 
and also we make our point against criminalization of protest protesters. So my third question has to do with this issue. What are the measures taken by the states to guarantee right to protest according to the international human rights standards? Thank you so much, Mr. President. Thank you. I give the floor now to Commissioner Macaulay. Margaret, please. Um, thank you, Mr. President. I also thank um, the civil society, the petitioners who have brought this matter up again before the Commission. And also, I thank the state for their um, response to the statements of civil society. I must particularly mention the mothers we have heard from. As a mother of an only child, I cannot imagine what I would do, feel, or even whether I would want to continue living if what you've described happened to my child. My child who is also black, is a person of color. I, 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 the, it's nightmarish to even consider it and please accept my sympathy. Um, I, my first question is to the state, and this is that, uh, could you please inform us what is the history um, of the failure of the granting of reparations, compensations, following extrajudicial killings by law enforcement officers in the United States? This is a matter that really surprises me as a common law lawyer and talking about a common law country. I'm, I'm surprised by this because in the um, English system and the British Commonwealth system, all the countries live by that principle and act on it. Uh, um, and my next question is, um, why also are armed police, uh, law enforcement officers, I think I use a better term to use, sent out to attend to persons who are having a health, mental, emotional health crisis? Is there not within the, the law enforcement forces specialized officers who can deal with these people? armed trained force being sent out to them and which results in so many deaths of people who are should have been helped to a health facility rather than being killed and end up in a morgue um, I can 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 you explain why that is so because I, I are there any forces in fact in the US, in any of the states, where they have these such specialized persons who can go out to deal with those who are having a health crisis. Um, and also, do you have, um, in, within the law enforcement um, various uh, uh, forces, a rule that before an officer goes out into public thoroughfares, that he has uh, he is given a certain amount of ammunition, which is recorded and which he signs to, and that when he returns, he has to account for whatever ammunition is, is, is the ammunition is checked again and must account for any ammunition which is mis missing from what he went out to. Do, is there any force which has that kind of protocol for their armed officers um, when they go out to deal with the public? Um, also, um, can you um, identify for us any states or cities within the United States um, which can be highlighted as having 
good practices for community policing presently within the United States, uh, um, especially when it comes to their encounter with um, Afro-American communities and peoples. And also, can you identify any city, uh, federal um, law enforcement, uh, municipal, um, state, uh, national <coughs> police uh, law enforcement um, structure, which has an independent, independent oversight mechanism of the actions of police officers, especially when it comes to the excessive uh, complaints of excessive use of violence, corruption, uh, mal malpractice of police officers, and most particularly extrajudicial killings. That they, it's an independent action is examined and analyzed by an independent mechanism and not an internal oversight mechanism. Is, is, are there such independent mechanisms in anywhere in the United States and not internal ones? And it seems to me from the reports we see and what we've seen on reported shown videos in the media that wherever whatever city police officers or law enforcement officers are, they seem to have a sameness of training when it comes to the chokehold, which stops person's breathing. And can you explain to the commission, is it, that the, these law enforcement forces of divergent cities have the same training as to the violence these officers are taught to use rather than them being taught proper use of violence, which should be reasonable, um, necessary, and proportional and meet with international uh, um, standards. Um, because we need to understand what is contained in their training curriculum. And I must say that as the special, as the Rapporteur of Afro-Descendant Rights, and particularly having heard the mothers and women also as the rapporteur of women's rights as well. I am extremely, extremely concerned about what is happening presently in the United States. One thing is that as time progresses, things should improve, but it seems that things are getting worse rather than improving. And I describe the treatment of the law enforcement officers as reported to us um, in the United States as historic, structure, uh, structural, and systematic, and endemic. I even say that it seems to be part of their DNA. And isn't it implicit for the state, the United, the United States, the most powerful nation in the world, to decide to do a full and in-depth study as to why, why this is so and has been so for so many years and is continuing. Because you have the finances that you can do such an in-depth study. The commission has done some, but we haven't seen that our reports on those, those studies have been successful. But I do know that the United States is interested in good policing. But it's not only to have the laws, to have the protocols, to have the plans. 
we must see effective implementation of these things. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Commissioner Macaulay. We have four minutes at the disposal of the Commission. I'm asking my colleagues if they want to, to take the floor. I, I request to make an efficient use of the remainder of the time. Commissioner Urrejola, please. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, well, hello to everyone. Um, as a rapporteur of memory, truth and justice, I would first of all like to say hello to Colette and all the Mothers Against Police Brutality. And I would like to send her a virtual embrace um, for the loss of your son, Clinton, and through you an embrace to all the mothers that you showed on the video, the mothers of Tori, Jamel, Daron, Jarvis. Um, all of you have denounced today the brutality of law enforcement and the racial discrimination and how this destroys not only um, your son's lives, but also it destroys your families as a whole. You have denounced that you have not received apologies, um, no justice. Um, and I just want to point out what the mother of Jarvis said. She said, instead of using a chaser, the police used a gun. And that instead of going up low, they went up high. And actually, these words are quite shocking. I don't know whether the rest listened to that, but they're quite shocking because she said that her son was going to work. So first of all, why did the police follow him? Secondly, why did they have to use a chaser, not, not alone a gun? Third, she said, instead of going low, they went up high. I mean, what this shows, I, I think, is that, first of all, the use of unreasonable force, but especially the, the, the structural discrimination against Afro-Americans, because she explained that her son was going to work. So why discuss that they should have used a chaser, they should have gone, and if they used a the gun, they should have gone up low instead of up high. I mean. Her words show the racial discrimination. Her words show when she talks about how her son was killed. Um, I am so sorry that this hearing is not in person. As a rapporteur of memory, truth and justice, I have known and been with so many mothers throughout the region, Latin America, Central America, the United States and Canada. Unfortunately, there are many mothers like you that have to, to talk about the loss of their children in, in the hands of, of the police or paramilitaries. Unfortunately, it's a situation that we see throughout the whole region. And all these mothers deserve justice, deserve truth, and you deserve to be heard. And I, ho I, really, I really hope that the testimonies you gave today here in this hearing, even though it's by Zoom, it's not the same as being in person, I really hope that you have a, at least a little sense of symbolic reparation, which is very important. I think these, these hearings are important to listen to testimonies of the victims and the mothers and mothers like you. And I sincerely hope this has been a, sp a space for you. I endorse um, the question that Flavia Piovesan made, but I would just want to ask civil society, but also the state regarding the, the brief act. I understand the brief act that you mentioned um, is like a new vision of public safety. The Commission has been working on public safety and human rights. We even have a report on, on these issues. And maybe not now, but maybe you could give us a bit more details of how the vision you have with the law enforcement and the question that Flavia Piovesan and Maurice May McCauley made regarding capacity building, etc., on, uh, on law enforcement. And I don't know, I understand it's a, it's a difficult question for the state, but I don't know whether the state has any position regarding this act. That's it, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Well, uh, we have completed the time uh, allocated to the commission. I'm sure that my colleagues have expressed in a very elo eloquent manner the concern of the rest of the members of the commission here present. Uh, we'll have now 12 minutes for civil society for a second round of intervention and 12 minutes for representative of the states as well. Please, have civil society, whomever wants to take the floor. Yes, thank you. Uh, we will begin with Jamil Darquar from the American Civil Liberties Union who wanted space to respond. Thank you, Justin, and thank you, uh, commissioners, and uh, also uh, my colleagues uh, uh, for the presentations. 
Uh, first, let me uh, quickly respond to some of the general allegations that were made. Uh, the state rep representatives uh, said that there are allegations of racial discrimination and unjustified use of force. Uh, let's, let's be clear. Uh, it's not about allegations uh, of racial discrimination. It's a well-documented racist policies and practices in the United States. And that's not about, is not contesting here whether uh, a particular act uh, or not where there was mounting evidence uh, suggesting that there is institutional racism and that should not be denied here by the state. The same applies to denying uh, systemic racism in policing in general, uh, which is something that we've heard today and should be pointed out that that is the, exactly what we are trying to address here. It's a matter of a fact. It's not something that we are going to argue about. Uh, the state mentions that there's justice will be served in the cases. In fact, most of the times, justice is not served. Uh, that's why Black Lives Matter protests erupted and erupt every time there are instances where people, black people are being killed and there's no justice being made. And you've heard from colleagues and from others against police brutality. And the use of force uh, norms it is well documented as well. The most recent report by University of Chicago Global Human Rights Clinic, which looked at use of force policies and practices in different states, showed that they are not in line with international standards on the use of force, when it's un completely necessary to use force, when it's justified to use force. And, and I think my, my colleague Francisco will be saying more on that. Uh, and I wanna just say one more thing about uh, the city of Minneapolis. If the state is really interested to hear from the city of Minneapolis and their decision to abolish the police, they should ask them to testify. You should ask them to be part of the U.S. delegation to testify before the commissioners. There's mischaracter mischaracterization of what the happening in the city of Minneapolis. In fact, the Justice Department under this administration blocked and did not approve a Department of Justice investigations into Minneapolis Police Department after the killing of George Floyd. Uh, this is the administration that clearly says that it is this, is this administration of the law and order. And so they are clear where they stand. And the final words about the Justice Department uh, investigations. We made a submissions on behalf of the ACLU uh, and wanna correct some of the clear misleading statements that were made by the state. The state is saying that they were launched over 90 investigation, pattern and practice investigations by DOJ since 1990. But they don't tell you that not a single one was ordered, initiated by this administration. In fact, there were, since 2009, DOJ opened 25 investigations to law enforcement agency and has been enforcing 14 consent decrees. But this administration under Attorney General Sessions who issued a policy that sets unprecedented barriers for DOJ attorneys to negotiate settlement agreements and consent decrees. And Attorney General Barr, the current Attorney General, continued his approach, refusing to use Section 14141 uh, to mandate reforms and prevent police killings. So this administration is clearly not interested in structural reforms of police department because they obstructed even consent decrees that were reached in the city of Baltimore, even in the, in the state, uh, in the city of Chicago in Illinois, etc. So uh, I think what, what this commission should be um, demanding is transparency and accountability with regard to the state statements here and to, and to make sure that the Department of Justice does more than just uh, uh, make the, uh, what the General Barr said uh, by saying that if um, um, the, he continues with the appreh apprehension of police oversight saying that communities that do not give support and show respect to their local law enforcement may, and this is a quote, find themselves without the police protection they need. Uh, this action suggests that the Trump administration is clearly seeking to modify and undo existing consent decrees, which were hard fought uh, by previous administrations. Uh, and, and that is uh, extremely dangerous when they are actually uh, given a green light for the use of force uh, and violence by, by law enforcement. Thank you, I turn it back to my colleague, Justin. Uh, thank you so much, Jamil. Um, I was gonna make some short remarks, Mr. President, commissioners, specifically in response to Mr. Weatherall's uh, statement regarding the um, pr 
the over 70 investigations that the Department of Justice has launched into policing on the local level throughout the country. Indeed, many of these police departments are amongst the largest in the country, covering millions of American citizens. To me, that in of itself is sufficient evidence for systemic uh, discrimination. The, the deep need which was felt in over 70 jurisdictions representing millions of people. And so I, I find it uh, very difficult in light of the evidence that we have presented to uh, defend the position that there is no systemic racism in American policing in the United States. In addition, this summer, as you know, uh, protests uh, took place around the country. Over 27 states um, had to imp impose curfews because of these protests. The New York Times uh, estimates nearly 26 million people participated in protests. Um, it, this summer, the United Nations um, Human Rights Council called for a uh, special investigation into the activities in the United States regarding policing. Uh, so not only has this been a situation that citizens around the country have been concerned about in an unprecedented way, protesting in a way that we've never seen before in American history, but the State Department should also take note that countries around the world um, are taking notice. Millions of people around the world are protesting this activity as well as states themselves uh, being willing to take the risk of protesting this activity. So in light of that, I think it's, it's very important for members of the state delegation to consider the failure of the current remedies to properly provide any sort of justice for these families. And for that, for that reason, uh, the BREATHE Act and, and uh, other submissions that we've made from Howard University and um, CGA, CJA have called for repertory justice for those victims, their families, and for those communities that are impacted by racialized police violence. The Inter-American Commission has a long and celebrated history of implement, helping with the implementation of repertory justice. Um, in our submission, we note uh, instances in Latin America where repertory justice for police violence have been successfully implemented. And so we would uh, suggest that both the state and the commissioners uh, refer to those submissions. Um, so without further ado, I wanted to uh, give space to uh, Gina Clayton Johnson to speak on behalf of uh, the Movement for Black Lives and to speak about the BREATHE Act. Oh. I see Ms. Car Carrie Kennedy. You, should I yield oh. my time? No, you go ahead. I'll, I'll talk after if there's time. Okay. Um, so thank you so much uh, to my uh, distinguished colleagues. I would like to just address a few points. Um, the BREATHE Act is about urging an examination of the root causes and full extent of the problem that, that we have on our hands. And it is not an aberrant, aberrant situation where one in two black men will be arrested by the age of 23, where we have 2.3 million people incarcerated, where we have 2.7 million children who have incarcerated parents, um, where we, have, we are living in a moment where there are protests happening in every city, um, throughout the country, in fact, in the, in one, in the course of one weekend uh, over Juneteenth, we had over 600 protests, and all of them uh, demanding defund, resign Trump. Um, there, they, we, have, um, we are living in a, a moment of reckoning um, because this issue is systemic. The demand to defund the police is a courageous acknowledgement that police power, budgets, resourcing, has really fueled their unaccountability in a culture of punitivity does, that does not solve crime, but doubles down on the trauma that breeds more on trauma that breeds more conflict. The idea that police are keeping communities safe is a myth. Teachers, doctors, social workers are keeping communities safe. Access to jobs, education, healthcare, these are the core functions that keep our communities safe. In fact, only 5% 
of calls that officers are responding to are for violent situations, and yet their budgets have grown so much that it is not uncommon to see law enforcement take up 40, 50, 70 percent of local budgets. You strip away at the basic needs of infrastructure and at, at, at our basic needs infrastructure, and you replace it with these a punitive force, and this is what you get. Recommendations for training or dealing with bad apple officers through convictions will not be sufficient to deal with reality that we have a budgetary problem in which the, in which the divestment of community needs continues to be disregarded. A ban on chokeholds did not keep Aaron, Eric Gardner alive. A ban on vehicular homicide did not keep police from mowing down protesters with their cars in several cities across this country. A ban on evidence tampering did not prevent police in Georgia from planting marijuana and crack cocaine on, on Katherine Johnson, a black woman in her 90s who they killed by shooting at her 39 times. What we need to do is to roll back the funding that has enabled this unaccountable, omnipotent growth of police power in the U.S. And this is something that has, that is not, has not always been the case. In the last 40 years, so you think that the revisionist history that was presented need, must, must, be, must include the war on drugs that in the last 40 years has rolled out after this, the, the winds of the civil rights movement in the 60s, uh, came in full force to oppress, to marginalize, and to cage millions of black Americans with, their pol with these policies. And this was an intentional, um, we've, we've heard the statements of Nixon um, administration officials that, that help us to understand the intent of these policies was not community safety, was not the wellness of, of um, Americans, but was in fact um, a political uh, agenda. So. And so those are, those are just a few of the points. I encourage the commission to look at the BREATHE Act because this is really where we yes. see our solutions um, to the systemic nature of this issue. I thank you. I thank you for your, your final remarks. Now I turn over to the, the, the delegation of the state. You have 12 minutes, please. Thank you very much. Um, let me begin by reiterating that the United States is dedicated to eliminating racial discrimination in policing. Um, you know, we've been through, in my lifetime alone, uh, a number of uh, difficult social upheavals that have led to change. And I'm personally optimistic that the events of the events that have been highlighted in, in the last uh, six months to a year, because these things have been going on for longer, the events that have been highlighted recently have galvanized the public and, and the, uh, uh, the, the Congress to look at how we can do better um, and, and how we can fix uh, some, of the, some of the problems in our society. Because we are not a perfect society and we need to keep struggling um, uh, to, to form a more perfect union. Um, more work has to be done to ensure fairness to all citizens, particularly members of the African American community. Uh, the United States is committed to ensuring that all levels of the state and federal justice system operate fairly and effectively for all, irrespective of race, and doing what works to keep our communities safe. The United States will continue working to meet these responsibilities. Uh, Mr. Chairman, as a country governed by the rule of law, the United States believes that individuals at every level of government and civilian actors must be held accountable for killings and violent acts. As Secretary of State Pompeo has stated repeatedly, the ongoing civic discourse in the United States related to policing and race is a sign of our democracy's strength and maturity. Our citizens work through difficult social pr problems openly knowing their freedoms are protected by the U.S. Constitution and respect for the law. Let me highlight just a few things from the recent U.S. executive order on, uh, on safe policing for safe communities, which is an important step toward, perhaps a first step toward addressing many of the issues that, are, that have been raised here today. The executive order says that the attorney general shall 
allocate Department of Justice discretionary grant funding only to those state and law and local law enforcement agencies that have sought or are in the process of seeking appropriate credentials from a rep reputable independent credentialing body. It also says the, the Attorney General shall identify and develop opportunities to train law enforcement officers with respect, with respect to encounters with individuals suffering from impaired mental health, homelessness, and addiction to increase the capacity of social workers working directly with law enforcement agencies and to provide guidance regarding the development and implementation of co-responder programs, which involve social workers or other mental health professionals working alongside law enforcement officers so that they arrive and address situations together. Attorney General and the Secretary of Health and Human Services shall prioritize resources as appropriate and consistent with applicable law to support these opportunities. It also says that the Attorney General and the Director of the Office of Management and Budget shall develop and propose new legislation to Congress that could be enacted to enhance the tools and resources available to improve law enforcement practices and build community engagement. With regard specifically to chokeholds, the Attorney General standard for certification uh, reads the executive order, shall at a minimum confirm that the state or local enforcement agency use of force policies adhere to all applicable federal, state, and local laws. And the state or local law enforcement agency's use of force policies prohibit the use of chokeholds. A physical measure that restricts an individual's, individual's ability to breathe for the purposes of incapacitation except in those situations where the use of deadly force is allowed by law, where the use of deadly force is allowed by law. Clearly, we're not talking about Mr. Floyd. I would just um, close by saying, again, reiterating that as a nation, we have some challenges facing us. But we are taking those challenges on. Um, Americans believe that um, reforms are necessary and the executive branch has already begun the process. It's just a start, but it is a start, a move in the right direction. With that, I'll close and I will turn it over to my colleague, Tom Weatherall. Thank you very much. Thank you, DCM Freden. Um, let me just quickly address a number of the, the questions that were raised in the previous session. Um, the first about pending legislation regarding reparations and structural reform. Um, regarding the BREATHE Act, we obviously invite the commission to review the legislation and just note that this is a subject of ongoing legislative attention. Um, and, and similarly, on the subject of reparations, this has also been a focus of longstanding congressional attention. Um, as you probably recall from last year, the commission held a hearing on that very subject and received information about a bill then pending before Congress, which was HR 40 or S 1083, which was entitled Commission to Study and Develop Reparation Proposals for African Americans Act. And one key takeaway from the proposed legislation um, in that context is that it's, it remains a difficult and, and complex issue. Um, that legislation proposed to establish a commission to study and develop reparation proposals and to report its finding to Congress. Um, as in that, that's, uh, with regard to that legislation, we, we then didn't take a position on it, but you know, use that again to note that this too is a subject of ongoing um, congressional attention. Uh, one sort of related point on the, the question of, of reparations is to distinguish reparations from remedies available, available for specific incidents um, under U.S. law. And as we discussed earlier in our presentation, there are remedies available under U.S. law for civil rights violations. And again, recalling that uh, in particular 42 U.S.C. section 1983 uh, provides for civil suits directly against state or local officials 
for money damages or injunctive relief. And similarly, under federal law, uh, federal officials may be subject to suit um, directly for damages arising from uh, provisions of the US Constitution or similarly under certain constitutional torts. And so while the question of reparations for structural issues remain a subject of ongoing debate in the United States, I think there's no question that there are compensatory remedies available um, to remedy official misconduct under US law. Um, turning briefly to Commissioner McCauley's question about the availability of a comparative analysis of police policies or practices regarding use of force and training. Uh, one potential resource that might be helpful in this regard would be uh, the Bureau of Justice Statistics, uh, which maintains a website at www.bjs.gov. Um, there, their studies are several years old, but they, they do provide um, comparative studies and statistics on police training and police policies that I think might be relevant to your question. Um, and then I will just briefly close by acknowledging Commissioner Piovasan's question about protests, and in particular, the right to freedom of peaceful assembly and association. And uh, you, you heard at length from us earlier today about the important place that these protections have um, under US law and under the US Constitution. And rather than repeating the presentation you've already heard from me before, I would just reiterate the importance of those protections under US law uh, long-standing protections and refer to my prior comments on that. So thank you. And with that, um, I will pass the floor to Andrew um, to close our presentation. Thank you. I'm in, in DCM Fred and um, underscoring that our, our discourse today, but also uh, previously in the Permanent Council of the OAS, does serve to enrich, enrich, inform our ongoing efforts to attempt to live up to our collective interest in the United States, as in most OAS member states. There is widespread agreement that law enforcement officials must be held accountable when they abuse their power. When officers and they do shake the public's faith in equal justice under the law. Well, I, well, in the United States, there is widespread agreement that the test generates into rioting and the destruction of lives or property. Law enforcement does play a crucial role, especially in minority communities that suffer from disproportionate rates of criminal violence. What is being debated in the United States, Mr. President, commissioners, uh, is the extent to which abuse of power against racial or other minorities is the result of bias built into the law enforcement or criminal justice system that must be eradicated to solve the problem. Our domestic uh, debate uh, in the United States concerns how best to ensure the police officers who use unjustified and unlawful force are held accountable without introducing such a level of retrospective uh, scrutiny so as to make it impossible for them to use force when justified in life or situations. We had made this point. We also know that combating racism and discrimination is not just a domestic issue for the United States. It's a challenge faced by every OAS member state and one in which we're committed to all working together to overcome and is the ongoing focus of many of our discussions in advance of the General Assembly uh, later this month. Uh, and this is also why the ongoing work of the OAS Secretariat, its social inclusion section, and of course the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights remains relevant uh, for all of us. So as we recommit to be working together into advancing the OAS decade for persons of African descent in the Americas, but also the UN International Decade for People of African Descent, the Department of State remains committed to attempting to promote equality, engage on equality by engaging historically marginalized groups to promote and improve access to justice, the political process, social services, education, economic opportunity, and inclusive security. So working Thank here you. with partners Thanks, in the OAS, we know that we have more to do. Uh, let me just Thank close you. by, we support uh, and, and, and value your input today. Thank you. I thank you. The final remarks of the commission will be made by the special rapporteur, Soledad Garcia Muñoz. Um, please, Soledad, you have the floor.
Excuse me. Thank you, Mr. President. Good morning, everyone. I would like to thank all members of civil society who are bringing this issue before the Commission and for the presence of the state. From the mandate, we are very much concerned with the roots of the structural inequalities that are present in many communities in the USA, especially on how the criminal justice system has exacerbated those circumstances by imposing irrational barriers towards access to justice. In the press release of August of 2020, the mandate pointed out this situation given that by 2018, at least 20% 20 of the African-American communities in the USA are living in poverty, therefore hindering their chances, for instance, to get the best available legal counsel, have the ability to post bail bonds without entering into worse economic situation than before or receiving mental health treatment. In this sense, it is important for the mandate uh, to know what efforts is the state making at its different levels to effectively deal with economic inequality when, according to public information, African-American households receive 60% less income than white households, which is part of the cause of this situation. So I really would like to have this information when the state is able to, to, to send this to the, to the commission as and as final remark, just to express that the recognition, respect, and investment on economic, social, cultural, and environmental rights as water, food, education, labor, housing, environment, all these rights are key for protecting black lives. And my mandate is willing to work with the commission, the USA, state, and civil society to make them come true. Thank you very much. I thank the special reporter. Well, we have come to an end. I couldn't make any statement, but I just say very few words. My last words are for Coletta Flanagan and for Mothers Against Police Brutality. Your testimony, your video has been uh, moving. It has called our attention to the, to the core of the problem. We are with you, you have our support, and we all here, civil society and the state are committed to the same cause to stop police violence and to end structural discrimination please have a good afternoon i thank you all for your participation and um, see you soon thank you thank you so much